Welcome to standard 16b. In this standard, we will try to assess the impact of economic development and global population growth on both the environment and society. By impact, we're looking for the effect. So assess the effect of economic development and global population growth on the environment and society. And by global, we mean worldwide. Okay, so not just in any one particular place, but worldwide. Okay, we have three essential questions we're attempting to answer in this standard. The first and the one we spend most time on is how does the developing world compare with the developed world in terms of economic, social, and population characteristics? Characteristics meaning the things that they have in common. So what are the things that developed countries have in common that make them developed countries? And what are the things that developing countries have in common that make them developed? developing countries. The essential understanding to help us with this question is, is an understanding that developed and, and developing countries, they do have different levels of economic development, they do have different population characteristics, and they do have different social conditions. You can imagine if uh, you were raised uh, and lived your life in the scene there on your screen, you would expect that the level of economic development, the population characteristics, and the social conditions would be different than if you were born and raised and lived your life in this scene. Okay, so the characteristics of the two places would be different. We'll try and take a look at these two, uh, two worlds, developed and developing, through the use of a Venn diagram. To begin with, the developed world, or sometimes referred to as first world countries, these are countries where the population tends to have high personal income. They tend to earn a lot of money. Uh, each year. They have high GDPs, these countries, and we see there at the bottom GDP is an economic term that we need to know. It means gross domestic product, and it refers to the value of all the goods and services produced in a country in a given year. So if you add up all the cars and all the furniture and all the clothing made in the country in a year, that gives you the GDP. Okay, people in developed countries tend to live on average longer lives, high life expectancy, there's low infant mortality, the sad statistic of babies who don't survive their first year, that tends to be low in the developed world. Uh, literacy tends to be high because kids tend to spend the first 18 to you know, 20 some odd years in school learning to read and write. Uh, there's a lot of access to health care in developed countries. There's low population growth rate because families tend to be on the smaller side in the developed world. And these would be countries like the United States, like Germany, like Japan. We'll say goodbye to the developed world for a minute and take a look at the developing world, which is pretty much the exact opposite of the developed world. Developing countries, sometimes referred to as third world countries, have low uh, personal income, not a lot of money earned each year. They tend to be farming countries, agricultural economies that don't have a lot of uh, economic value brought in each year. Growing, tomato, growing vegetables and fruit isn't going to bring in as much money to the country as selling um, computer technology and cars. Life expectancies, sadly, um, on average are lower. And again, that's in part because infant mortality is much higher in developing countries. Uh, because these tend to be farming economies, a lot of kids are put to work at an early age and aren't given the opportunity to learn to read and write. So uh, literacy tends to be relatively low. There's not a lot of health care access in developing countries. And because, again, they're typically farming countries, uh, these families in developing countries tend to be larger and that leads to higher population growth. Countries that are considered developing countries would be countries like Haiti, Afghanistan, and Sudan. Okay, we put these all together and you see how the opposite is true on, on each side of, of the Venn diagram. There is a middle ground called the second world, countries like China, India, and Brazil that have some characteristics of developed countries, but also some characteristics of developing countries. 
Okay, on this map here, we can see the uh, the blue countries are the developed countries. The more blue it is, the more developed it is. And the uh, orange and red countries are the developing countries. The more red it is, the less developed it is. Okay, and we'll take a look at some uh, individual statistics here to give us a sense here. In a developed country like the United States, income is high. An average salary in the United States might be $50,000 a year compared to just $1,300 in a developing country like Haiti. Okay, life expectancy in a country like Japan, a person uh, born can expect on average to live almost 85 years, where sadly in a country like, like Angola, that number is less than half, only about 38.2 years, less than 40 years on average. A lot of those low life expectancies in the developing world have to do with high infant mortality. Uh, the first year is a very dangerous year in, in developing countries. In comparison, a country like Sweden, a developed country, only three infants don't make it through the first year on average due to accidents, um, illness, uh, things like that. Whereas in a developing country like Afghanistan, that number, it's a, it's a heartbreaking number, 188 out of every thousand. I mean, that's almost that's almost 20 percent or one out of every five. That's going to cut into average life expectancies. Literacy, a developed country like Argentina has almost 100 percent, 98 percent of the population can read and write compared to 39 percent in a developing country like Ethiopia. Access to health care, a developed country uh, like Belgium, a doctor might be responsible for about 250 patients. Uh, a developing country like uh, Cambodia, one doctor might be responsible for over 5,000 patients. Okay, so a difference there. And then the population growth. The developing countries, because they tend to be farming countries, tend to have larger kids or larger kids, larger families, um, and in a country like Uganda, that's 3.8% growth rate each year compared to a very slow growth rate of 1% in the United States. And some European countries even have negative growth rates, like Germany okay, is actually decreasing because, again, the average family size has gotten so small. Okay, our second question here is what impact are economic development and population growth having on the environment? By impact, again, we mean effects and rapid population, meaning fast population growth. What effects are they having on the environment? And the simple answer in terms of our understanding is a major impact our economic development and our rapid population is having a very big impact on the environment. Okay, we see this in our, our population growth. Uh, more of us means we need more space. The world's not getting any bigger land-wise. Okay, more people are going to require more space. We see our, our population here on this chart uh, from 1950 when the world's population was 2.5 billion projected to increase very rapidly to about 9 billion in 2050. Well, all those additional people um, produce more waste. Okay, we need more space to dump all of our, our garbage. We need more food, so we're going to have you know areas of the world that weren't typically used for farming. Uh, we expand into people moving to live in parts of the world that typically weren't lived in before. Okay, economic development. Our, our higher standard of living comes at a cost to the environment. And, and by uh, standard of living, we mean our quality of life. We see it in a thing like China, which in 1980, early 1980s was relatively poor and, and not many cars. We see here on this graph uh, less than one uh, million cars in China in 1985 as China's quality of life has improved as its economic uh, condition has, has improved, we see that number go up to uh, almost 30 million. Of course, having a car makes your quality of life much nicer, but it does come at a cost. Okay, There's an environmental cost to more cars on the road producing more pollution. 
Okay, our third uh, thing here, as we mentioned, is pollution. Okay, things that contaminate or make the, the environment dirty um, is, is an effect of our economic development. We need more energy, for example. So we're going out into the oceans to drill for oil. You might remember a few years back uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, the oil rig that exploded and, and leaked all the oil into the Gulf of Mexico and create a huge environmental disaster for wildlife. Uh, our factories producing all the stuff that we that we need. It produces um, you know, all sorts of pollution going up into the air, water pollution, uh, different parts of the world where sewerage uh, is just pumped untreated into the waterways. Again, more people create more more pollution. Hey, climate change. Uh, we're seeing the long-term weather pattern. We're not talking about it on a particular day or even a particular year, but over a long period of time, the climate, the weather is changing. We see, for example, uh, the global temperature on average has increased about a degree over the past 150 or so years. And we might say, well, one degree doesn't sound like very much, but we see it in pictures like this. We have a beautiful national park in Montana called Glacier National park named for all the glaciers in it we see that one degree temperature increase has helped to melt in 1960 what was a large glacier in the top picture to what it looks like today we also know that the global ice caps are melting about 20 percent in the arctic circle has melted and we're looking at the possibility of rising sea levels that are going to have impacts along the coast like we see here in the southeast of the United States. Okay, also more people mean loss of habitat. Habitat meaning the natural living space for, for living things. Okay, the homes for living things. More people mean less space for other living things. You're looking here at a picture of the last uh, known Tasmanian tiger. It died and the species went extinct in 1936. This very interesting looking thing called a quagga, which went extinct in uh, 1887. The golden toad, no, no more of them. They went extinct in 1996. The uh, passenger pigeon went extinct in 1914. These all uh, no longer exist because their habitats were altered or destroyed in large part because so many more of us. We see here in this chart as the uh, world's population has gone up, there's been a very close correlation as the world's population of people has gone up, the number of ex uh, species going extinct has correspondingly gone up as well. Okay, our last question has to do with the link between economic and political freedom. Okay, so sound economic conditions contribute to stable democracy, stable meaning firmly established. Okay, and political freedom helps to foster or promote, support, or encourage economic development. In our chart here, we can see countries that have less political freedom tend to have less political, less economic growth. The countries that have more economic freedom tend to have higher economic growth. We see that in this chart as well. As you increase political freedom, you typically increase economic growth, okay, as we see here. Okay, uh, we can take a look here at free market or capitalist economies. They tend to produce rising standards of living. The quality of life on average increases in these economies and produces an expanding or increasing middle class. Okay, we can see here on this chart the percentage of the world's population considered middle class has increased from very little in 1820 to almost 60 percent of the world's population today. Okay, as the middle class increases, as people get more money, that changes to produce growing demands for more political freedoms. So you can think about yourselves as teenagers, if you're working a part-time job and you're starting to get some money of your own, typically you're expecting some more uh, decision-making over that money than you did when you were five. 
Okay, the more money you get, the more power. As I say, money is power. So economic uh, development has led to increased demands for political freedom. And we see that in countries like South Korea and Taiwan today. And that wraps up Standard 16B.